All right, I think we should get started. So today we are very happy to have Catherine Beck visiting from Caltech, and she's going to talk about the role of resonance in the evolution of planetary systems. So, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about work that I've done with a number of collaborators, so I just want to acknowledge them before I get started. Um, I worked with Konstantin Batigan, who's at Caltech with me, and I'll also be describing some work that I did with Matt Holman and Matt Payne, who are at the CFA. Um, so I'd like to start with the solar system. The solar system has a number of uh, qualitative features that collectively are referred to as the orbital architecture. So these are things like the fact that there are terrestrial planets in the inner regions of the solar system and gas giants and ice giants in the outer regions. Uh, the orbits of the planets are <coughs> nearly coplanar, um, and the orbital plane, the common orbital plane of the planets, is also lined up with the spin uh, angular momentum of the sun. Furthermore, the eccentricities of all of these planets are quite low with the exception of Mercury. So the solar system appears to us dynamically cold. Um, these features, uh, however, uh, as of 20 years ago, were impossible to determine whether or not they were ubiquitous and whether or not they'd be common of all planetary systems or if they were somehow unique to our own. And the reason why it was impossible to tell was because 20 years ago, we only knew one uh, planetary system orbiting a main sequence star. Um, so since then, a lot's happened. Um, we've discovered thousands of exoplanet systems. And so we can now place the solar system into a greater context um, and also study exoplanet systems as this new class of astrophysical objects like stars or galaxies um, and learn about um, their formation and evolution. So one of uh, the first things that we've learned is that exoplanet systems can be extremely diverse. Um, unlike the solar system, we also see planets that uh, occur on very, very large uh, scales, like HR8799, which has four um, many Jupiter mass planets, uh, all orbiting at distances of many tens of AU. Um, we know that systems can also occur very, very near to their host star. Uh, one very striking example is the KY500 system, which has five planets. They're all larger than Earth, and they all have orbital periods less than 10 days. So they're really packed in there. Um, we know that so orbit. the direct imaging yeah. one, is there? Yeah, so I guess there's no resolution to be able to probe anything closer in? Uh, I think they might have upper limits mm -hmm. on how bright they could be, um, but because there's sort of the speckle yeah. pattern. Yeah, yeah. So I think. Uh, so I guess maybe. Have anything. It could have had. It could have. That's closer. Yeah, we just don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also know that systems can have dynamically excited orbits. Um, here is Kepler-56. Um, this has two planets. They're both transiting. They lie in a common orbital plane, um, but that orbital plane is misaligned from the spin of the host star by something like 45 degrees. Um, and it's thought that this misalignment uh, is a result of some uh, dynamical interaction from a third body, uh, distinct from these three here. Um, we also know that uh, gas giants, in particular, can have quite eccentric orbits. Here I'm showing the, these, all these points are uh, observed exoplanets. The blue are those that are only in single. There's only one planet known in those systems. And the red are for uh, planetary systems with more than one planet. Um, this is the orbital eccentricity of the planet as a function of the orbital period. And what you can see is that even uh, orbits nearly parabolic um, are found. Um, this is quite different from our own solar system, where, of course, the gas giants and ice giants have circular orbits. Um, another way to underscore, the, underscore this diversity is on a panel showing the planet mass and the separation. And what you can see is that both of these axes scale many orders of magnitude, <coughs> and that we found planets basically across this entire panel, except down here where our techniques aren't sensitive yet. What you can see is that uh, although this uh, panel reflects lots of observational biases, uh, there are distinct populations of planets. There are large, uh, or very large planets at large orbital distances, like HR8799. There are things that we might think of Jupiter analogs. Um, roughly 10% of sun-like stars have a Jupiter analog with the same major axis, less than 5 AU. Uh, we also know that there's this uh, more rare, or comparatively more rare class of gas giants found on very, very short orbital periods. Uh, what, these are known as hot Jupiters. But only 1% of sun-like stars have these. Um, and finally, there's this large population of planets that are intermediate in size between, super, between Earth and Neptune. Um, and they're also smaller than Earth, um, but collectively, these are referred to as super Earths and mini Neptunes. Um, yes. Is it, so, how much of the <coughs> sort of morphology of this is defined by, you know, the set of different sorts of experiments uh, that have detected them? Like, like, are these really distinct, or are we seeing, you know, these are regions of sensitivity for different different methods so, of finding them? So. Um, 
these are all, are all found by radial velocity, and radial velocity should then also be able to find massive planets on shorter orbital periods, because those are actually easier to find. So for example, this lack here is real. Um, same here, Neptunes, um, these would also be easy to find because we're finding smaller planets, but there's also this lack here. So I'd say all of these, these this lack here and this lack here are real, and then anything down here. <coughs> And also over here, I'd say, we don't know. OK, so. okay. and so um, an example of one of these systems is the KY500 system that I mentioned before. Um, and so actually, th during this talk, I'm going to focus on work about these small planets. Uh, so I just want to give you a little bit more background about how uh, we know about them. And by far, the majority of these were detected by the Kepler telescope, which was detecting planets using the transit method. Uh, using this technique, uh, it detected over 5,000 planet candidates, the majority of which are actually real uh, planets. If you're interested in planetary dynamics, uh, the relevant information for many of these is that uh, over half of them are found in multi-planet systems, uh, some of which are shown here. Um, so through analyses of this data, uh, it's been established that these planets are extremely common. <coughs> half of sun-like stars have a small planet with a period less than 85 <coughs> days, and this rate increases to almost two planets on average per star for stars that are less massive than the sun for M dwarfs. And so because of that, it's extremely important for us to understand how this system, of, how this population of planets formed and evolved because they represent a very common outcome of planet formation. Um, what's important to realize though is that what we're looking at, this population uh, at present, is just a snapshot of these systems uh, as they formed and evolved. Um, and what we really like to know is basically the initial conditions, how planets form, how they're assembled, and where in the disk, as well as characterize all of the various processes that might shape orbits in time. And by understanding both the formation and the evolutionary processes of planets, uh, we can explain this diversity, which seems um, very striking uh, in the observed population today. So any results from Kepler-2 yet? This is yeah. The status is um, so Ke yeah, so they found there are more systems that are found. They're in this Group. I guess one really exciting uh, result from K2 is um, a hot Jupiter with two small companions. So it was previously thought that hot Jupiters were lonely. Uh, they were the only planets in the inner regions, and that reflected this dynamical mechanism that brought them there. Um, but there is a system with a hot Jupiter and two super Earths on either side. Um, so that's a really cool result from K2. But I think right now, as of, as of now, K2 hasn't qualitatively changed the picture from Kepler. Yeah. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, these processes that could shape planetary orbits. Um, and during the first part of my talk, I'll be describing orbital instability uh, of planetary systems. This is an important process to understand because uh, the time scale for planet formation can be sh very short compared to the time scales for instability. And so a system that might be long-lived on the formation time scale might show instability on longer time scales, uh, which can cause uh, very uh, drastic rearrangements of the planetary system. Um, resulting in a very different system that we see today. And so we need to understand this process if we want to basically use the observations to learn about how planets form. Um, the second part of my talk is going to be about how planets interact with protoplanetary disks, uh, and in particular the very specific question of how two planets near a resonance um, <coughs> and interacting with the protoplanetary disk, how, how that system evolves. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to be considering these two processes in the context of the Kepler planets, these low mass systems of planets uh, that are very, very close to their host stars. Um, and what you'll see as I get into the details is that in order to understand the dynamics of multi-planet systems, you really need to understand the resonances uh, in these systems. Um, and so that'll make more sense as I move along. Okay, um, so to begin with, uh, I got interested in the question of long-term stability because of work that I did on the Kepler-36 system. So this is a two-planet system. Uh, their orbital periods are 14 and 16 days. Um, and what that means is that these planets are orbiting very, very close to each other. If you were living in some version of Seattle on Kepler-36b, the inner planet, Kepler-36c would appear this large in the sky. Um, and just for reference, here is how big the moon looks. Uh, and you have two space needles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so this is supposed to be Earth, oh, Earth I see. Seattle, oh, okay. and moon. Yeah, yeah, and just to show oh, you for scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, sorry. Yeah. 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 Maybe there should be like a little <laughs> dash line between the <laughs> But, yeah. Um, another way to think about how close they are is actually a closest approach. The distance between them is only five times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Um, so they're interacting very, very strongly. Um, another really very interesting thing about the system that's a consequence of their orbital dynamics uh, is that it's the best constrained planetary system we know of in terms of masses and full three-dimensional full three orbits 
uh, outside of the solar system. And so because these constraints are so exquisite, um, I'm just going to spend uh, a really short amount of time describing to you how we arrive at them. Um, we, these, the system is constrained via something called transit timing variations. The basic idea is that if you have a single planet in a system and it transits a tow star, then that motion, because it's Keplerian, implies that the transits occur exactly periodically. But when you put in another planet, there's mutual gravitational interactions between the planets, and they cause the transit to sometime come a bit earlier or come a bit late compared to what you'd expect. So these are the transit timing variations for Kepler 36b and c. Um, this, so the y-axis here, this is the deviation from a constant period orbit uh, as a function of time, and these are the different transits. Um, what you can see, these transits are, these variations are several hours. They're very easy for us to measure. Um, they're extremely large and erratic. Um, there's these sort of distinct jumps that you get. These occur when the planets are conjunction and interacting most strongly. Um, okay. So these planets are uh, interacting very, very strongly, and this, by modeling these transit time variations, that's how we then constrain the masses and orbits. Um, I've done a fair amount of other work on TTVs in the past year, um, and I didn't want to talk about it too much because I spoke a little bit about it last time I visited, um, but if you're interested, please ask me more about it. So is there planet A too? Uh, so the star is by convention A. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but so uh, my work on Kepler 36 came in because basically we had this great, these great constraints on the orbital parameters and masses. So we had a posterior distribution for initial conditions uh, and masses of these planets. And that meant that you could take that ensemble and integrate it forward in time to characterize the long-term dynamics, which are pretty much guaranteed to be interesting because of how strongly these planets are interacting. And so what we found was basically the first robust discovery of chaos in a planetary system outside the solar system. Um, what that means is that small in a chaotic system, small perturbations to an orbit grow exponentially in time. And they exponentially grow on a time scale called the maximum Lyapunov time. For Kepler 36, we measured that Lyapunov time and for that distribution of initial conditions. Um, and this is what we found. You can see that uh, so all of the orbits are chaotic that are consistent with the data. Um, and the time scale for the chaos is very, very short. It's only 15 years. Um, but the right way to think about how rapid this is is to compare it to the natural time scale of the system or the orbital period of the planets. Um, for Kepler 36, the Lyapunov time is only 1,000 orbits of the inner planet. Um, and just for comparison, in the solar system, the Lyapunov time is 10 million orbits of Mercury. So this system is really extremely chaotic. Um, you'll also notice that there's this small uh, bump here at very, very short Lyapunov times, only you know, several hundred years. <coughs> Um, and that corresponds to initial conditions that actually, they're, they're consistent with the data, but they exhibited instability um, during our integrations. So Kepler-36 is, of course, long-lived because we're observing it, but what this is telling you is that the system is very, very close to the edge of stability. And so what this then motivated me to ask was, um, what would have happened if the planets were more massive or more eccentric or closer together? Uh, how close could you actually stick two planets before they exhibit instability? So this question is not just theoretically motivated, um, it's also uh, observationally motivated by other uh, Kepler systems. So this here, this is the period ratio distribution um, of planet Paris found in Kepler, and Kepler 36 is right here. Uh, this is very likely a false positive. Um, but Kepler 36 is sitting in this bin here, um, and you can see that it's on the edge of this distribution. Um, however, there is this interesting drop off in the number of pairs as you get to very, very compact orbits. And so one interesting question to consider is whether or not planet pairs initially formed on these compact orbits but subsequently underwent instability. Um, and that's something I'll come back to at the end of the talk. So in initial conditions for your simulation are uh, generic or, or you probe through various initial conditions? So for Kepler-36, we had a set of initial conditions that matched the transit time variation data. Uh -huh. And that formed a very small sort of blob in phase space. Uh -huh. um, and then the work I'm going to be describing now is for very general initial conditions. Um, but the, the conclusion was, though, that, that almost all these things looked very unstable, but somehow Kepler-36 must be stable. Yeah. So, so what we found was that as you integrated the initial conditions, um, sort of on longer and longer integrations, more and more would exhibit instability up to a certain point. And then there was a small region in the center sort of of that blob that did not exhibit instability. Um, that actually corresponded to only something, it corresponded to something like 5% of the initial 
uh, population. And so that's where we predict the real system needs to okay, be. Okay, should yeah. I think of that as being you know, like on the way right edge of this the off and off time distribution or something? Or oh, um, no, they're actually just sort of mixed in here. But it's just when you integrate for longer and longer, um, it turns out that, uh, so the off and off time, uh, should, like formally it's defined as the limit as time goes to infinity. And so these integrations, which have a finite time, are just approximations. Okay. So what you see is that when you integrate longer, more of these actually make their way over to this population. You get I a see. better character. <coughs> yeah. okay. um, because the, the estimate of the off and off chain time changes when they start to exhibit instability. Um, so if I made the same plot for a longer integration, this peak would be bigger and this one would be smaller. But we predict it has some final distribution as t goes to infinity with a small peak here that stays there. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'll be describing sort of the general theoretical work we did on the stability of two planet systems. Um, so this is a, a very classic problem uh, in physics, um, especially because it's so pertinent to our own solar system's evolution. Um, for two planet systems in particular, there is a very hard, uh, precise analytic result that's very useful. It's called the Hill criterion, and it's criterion for collisional stability. So what it tells you is that essentially based on conservation of energy and angular momentum, you can evaluate this Hill criterion and if two planets satisfy it, they're protected from collisions. And if they fail it, then they, uh, collisions are possible um, within the amount of phase space that's available to them. <coughs> um, however, uh, even if two planets don't actually ever collide with each other or their orbits never cross, uh, you can still have repeated weak interactions, which lead to a net transfer of energy and angular momentum between the orbits. Um, and that is another type of more general instability called the Grange instability. And I'm showing an example of that here. So this is actually an initial condition which fits the Kepler-36 data. Um, so these are two planets that have very low eccentricities. Their period ratio uh, is near one, but it's not at one. Um, and what you can see is that although the eccentricities don't grow and the period ratio never goes to one, so they never actually, their orbits never cross, um, there's still an instability that sets in. Um, and that's, that's what we want to characterize. Um, but there's no general analytic criterion for this. And so that was sort of the problem that we were, that's the context we're working in. Um, to give you a little bit more motivation, here I'm showing uh, in black, these are the location of unstable orbits in phase space uh, as a function of the period ratio of a pair of planets and the initial angle between the planets. And in white are regions where we integrated and we determined that they were uh, long lived. Uh, in red now, this dashed line shows the approximate location of the hill boundary. So you can see already that there's some shortcomings. There's orbits which fail the hill criterion uh, but are long lived. And that's because the Hill criterion is a sufficient but not necessary criterion for stability, for collisional stability. There's also orbits which uh, satisfy the Hill criterion but are still unstable, and that's in this more general Lagrange sense. Uh, another very striking uh, feature of this plot uh, is that there's so much structure. Um, and the fact that there's so much structure basically means it's something that we can understand. And I think, um, yeah, the fact that there's so much structure just means that this should be, a, even though instability seems like a tough problem, it's something that yeah, we should be able to understand. Um, and what you'll notice, or what one key to understanding it, is that these features, these horizontal features, occur at very specific period ratios. And they occur at period ratios that correspond to mean motion resonances between the planets, which means that their period ratios uh, form a rational number. So the key criterion is the criterion of the period ratio, or what is it? Uh, so it's, it's a criterion that you evaluate it based on, you plug in the uh, energy of the orbit and the angular momentum, and it ends up that it depends on energy times angular momentum squared. And that has to be, I think, less than a particular value for them to be hill stable. And so for nearly circular orbits, it ends up being a criterion on the separation between them. But you could evaluate it for eccentric orbits as well. So for this, this is in the... So it's assumed six, um, circular orbits. No, so I guess um, these all have, all of these initial conditions have the same eccentricity. So I can evaluate basically what is the critical separation for that eccentricity. And that's what, what this dashed line is. OK. Um, so to motivate a bit more why resonances are so important for stability, um, I'd like you to consider the case now where you have two planets near mean motion resonance, so near the 2 to 1 mean motion resonance. And I've started them up at conjunction. This is where the planets are interacting most strongly. And so as the planet orbits evolve, what you see is that conjunctions always happen at the same location of the orbits. And because conjunctions <coughs> are where they interact most strongly, that means that these small gravitational impulses that the planets give each other add coherently in time. And this is that 
the you know, standard resonant effect that small perturbations can add up over time coherently to produce a large um, effect. And that's the reason why resonances are important if you care about stability, because that's basically the location where these small perturbations that the planets give each other actually matter. Um, more generally, you can have a system that is near resonance, but not exactly. It just misses the um, exact period ratio. And in that case, what you can have is basically the longitude of conjunctions will circulate about the orbit, where the amount that it circulates uh, depends on how much they miss the exact period ratio. And then finally, you can also have a system that is in resonance, but not precisely at the resonance, at the fixed point, um, in which case, now I'm just showing the longitude of conjunctions, but it oscillates about a fixed point in the orbit. <clears throat> and so there's these three sort of distinct <coughs> regimes of motion. There's longitude of conjunctions always happening at the same place, circulating about the orbit, or oscillating about a fixed point. And those three regimes uh, are actually extremely reminiscent of a very classical uh, standard problem in uh, physics, which is the simple pendulum. So here I'm showing just the phase portrait for a simple pendulum. This is the momentum and the angle. These are lines of constant energy, or constant Hamiltonian, um, but for different initial conditions. And so there is a fixed point in this phase portrait. There can be oscillations about that fixed point, circulations about the fixed point. Um, and what's most important for both cases is that there's this dividing orbit called the separatrix, which divides the phase space into a, motion, into a region that's in resonance and outside of resonance. And so this, this sort of analogy is going to help us understand the, the two-planet case um, later on. So to, to use resonances to study stability, we apply something called the resonance overlap criterion. Uh, this is due to Chirikov, who developed it when he was studying um, plasma physics, uh, I think in the 70s. Um, and basically what this states is that if you have a region of phase space which is simultaneously in resonance for more than uh, one resonance, then that overlap region is going to be chaotic. Um, and it's an interesting criterion if you care about stability because chaotic orbits often uh, show instability on short time scales. And so you can use a criterion for chaos <coughs> as an effective criterion for instability. <coughs> Sorry, there it is. Yeah. So we wanted to apply this to a system of two massive planets near mean motion resonance. Um, I want to point out that we're building off of previous work, which considered uh, the same problem but in a simpler context. So in the circular restricted three-body problem, where you have uh, a massive, two massive bodies on a circular orbit, and then you study the motion of test particles in that potential. And that's what these white lines are. They show the, the potential services for this uh, problem. Um, it works very well in our solar system uh, because Jupiter is much, much more massive than the other planets in the solar system. Um, and so that's what Jack Wisdom applied it to in 1980. Um, however, there's no guarantee it's going to work well for exoplanet systems, especially when you have a system like Kepler-36 with comparable mass planets uh, and non-zero eccentricities. Um, so the challenge then for us was to basically um, to expand the number of degrees of freedom and to treat the full complexity of the problem. Okay. So um, the first thing we had to consider was, or we had to determine was which resonances are most important. And so we're considering mean motion resonances, which correspond to these repeated close interactions between planets. And so that's when the period ratio between the planets takes this form, where m and n are integers. So for example, when n equals 1, you have the first order resonances. So these are things like the 3 to 2 and the 2 to 1. Uh, in between each first e pair of first order resonances, there's a second order resonance. In between each second and first order resonance, there's a third order resonance. In between each third and first, there's also a fourth order resonance, um, and so on. And so initially, this seems quite daunting because there's this countably infinite number of resonances that we're going to need to take into account. Um, however, the strength of each resonance, essentially the coefficient of each of these resonant terms. Sorry, can you yeah. explain what you're plotting here? Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is just a schematic. So this is the, a number line, basically that shows you where oh, I different see. period one and a half to two, okay. Yeah, the location okay. of different resonances on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the, x, the y axis the y is some sort of strength of... Oh, no, sorry. Actually, the y axis doesn't mean anything. Right. Um, it's right. just, yeah, to cool. distinguish between the different orders of the resonance. So this was first, second, third, and n equals four, where the order is that n. Got it. So. Okay. Can you show earlier a graph that was based on, on Kepler data that showed actually the occurrence rate of these uh, yes. resonances? Yeah. So would you want to look at that and say what are the most common ones and then do uh, this exploration? Yeah, so that'll be actually the whole second half of my talk. Yeah, yeah good question though. Um, okay, so yeah, so there's all these resonances that potentially we need to think about, but 
uh, the coefficient of these scales, like the eccentricity of the planets to the power n, where n is the order of the resonance. And so that means that a fourth order resonance depends on eccentricity to the fourth power. Um, and so that's just not going to be an important term for Kepler planets, which have uh, moderate to low eccentricities. So we, in this study, only focus on the first order mean motion resonances. So we need to calculate their widths. Um, how we do that, we start with the Hamiltonian for point masses interacting gravitationally. And then there's a series of canonical transformations that transforms the Hamiltonian into a form that looks like this. And this is basically the pendulum analogy that I spoke about earlier. You have a momentum squared term. Uh, there's the angular dependence. But now it's just something like the force of gravity or the restoring force depends on the momentum. And so keeping with this analogy, though, here's the phase portrait or a, um, a cartoon version of the phase portrait for two planets. Um, so now the momentum depends on the eccentricities and the period ratio of the planets. And the angle is the resonant angle. It tells you where conjunctions happen uh, in the orbit. And again, there's this important uh, separatrix curve that gives the resonance some width, um, and that's what we need to calculate uh, to determine how wide these resonances are. Um, so here now I'm showing uh, the results of analytic calculations for the five to four resonance. So this black curve is a separatrix for the five to four resonance as a function of period ratio and the initial angle between the planets. And this now is in the case of uh, initially circular orbits. And so underneath every single these different numbers, there's a fixed point, a stable fixed point, so you can have oscillations about it. And then there's also these unstable fixed points. So you, what you can see is that this five to four resonance, it sort of looks like four copies of the pendulum um, all in a row. Because here there is a stable fixed point and then an unstable fixed point. And more generally, what we showed was that for the m plus one to m mean motion resonance, uh, there are m analogs of the pendulum all lined up in a row. So now, when I show you the plot of period ratio and initial angle, these are now the, the separatrices of many of the first order mean motion resonances, um, you can understand the structure. For the five to four, there's four of these pendulums. For the six to five, there's five. And for the seven to six, there's six, and so on. And so what's important for, is that um, the widths of these resonances, they actually get bigger as you move to more compact orbits, as the period ratio goes toward unity. Um, but the distance between them is shrinking. And so that means that there must be a point when they overlap. And that's when the criterion, the resonance overlap criterion, <coughs> that the orbits will be chaotic. Um, and so that's what we calculated. Um, so just to make sure, yeah. so just going back to the kind of simple picture that you showed with the 1 to 2 or 2 to 1 resonance. Yeah. Um, so on that plot, then it should have had just one kind of island, right? Because yeah. it was just one, mm -hmm. what do you call it, longitude of uh, conjunction. Yes, longitude of conjunction. Yes, yeah. longitude of conjunction. Yeah. So, um, so is there a reason why that's, I guess that's further down then? Yeah, uh, so that would be like way up here on this oh, yes, plot. Two, yes, two to one, sorry, um, two, so it would be. So, and I guess the reason why I didn't plot it was because for low mass planets, so these, the planets for this plot are something like five Earth masses, and that ends up just being very widely separated from any other resonance, so it's not going to overlap. You only get overlap for very low mass planets when the planets get very compact. Yeah, so that would just look like an isolated resonance, yeah. but then it's, there's no chaos really associated with it. Um, so what we found, though, was that <coughs> the, again, this is in the initially circular limit, that the, these resonances will overlap if the same major axes A of the planets satisfy this criterion. They're less than some critical value, uh, where that critical value depends only on the mass of the planets relative to the mass of the star to the two sevenths power. And so what this states is that if you have a pair of planets that are more compact than this, the orbits will be chaotic, and therefore we'd also predict that they'd be, uh, show instability on short time scales. Uh, what's particularly interesting about this is that it only depends on the total mass of the two planets. It doesn't depend on the mass ratio between the planets. And that means that, at least for this problem, uh, the result is basically the same as for the circular restricted three-body problem, where when you take the, uh, the mass of one of the planets to zero, because the mass ratio between the planets doesn't matter. Um, and so indeed, we found that we recovered essentially the same result that Jack Wisdom found, where he found a, a resonance overlap region scaling like the mass of the massive planet to the two seventh power. But the, like something else, like a time scale has to depend on the mass ratio or something, right? Um, <laughs> like, so if you look- You have a particle of dust or something that's causing an instability. <laughs> Uh, no, no, so it's um, the dust is or that or like the asteroid's orbit would be unstable, not the Jupiter. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. No, Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, these are some numerical results now um, showing uh, in red 
the location of chaotic orbits on the same panel of initial conditions, period ratio, and initial angle between the planets. Um, these are now for slightly eccentric orbits. Um, what you can see is that the structure of this is reminiscent and is essentially very strongly dominated by the resonant structure that I spoke of earlier. So near the five to six, there's sort of five of these uh, islands. For the six to seven, there's six of them, and so on. And then you can see that here, they're, overlap they're overlapping nearly completely, and so that the phase space looks almost entirely chaotic. Um, in black now, I'm showing the location of, on the same panel of initial conditions, these same integrations where the orbits are unstable. Um, and basically, so underneath every single black point, which reflects an unstable orbit, there's a red point, and that's because all unstable orbits are chaotic. Um, in white are regions where the orbits are both stable and regular, um, so they're not chaotic and they're also long-lived. And so for the most part, what this is telling you is that the criterion for chaos can be used as a criterion for instability. So we're sort of on the right path here. Um, there's just this fringe out here at the edge of this chaotic web uh, where orbits are chaotic but long-lived. And that's definitely a minority of orbits, but it's also quite important because that's where a system like Kepler-36 would lie, um, and also in a much higher dimensional space, that's where our solar system would lie. Um, and finally, I just want to show, this is just a really cool plot. Um, this shows the time scale for instability on that same panel of initial conditions where, so darker colors reflect a shorter instability time. And, so, and that's what's shown up here. And so what you can see is that the time scale for instability grows uh, linear, well, in a log sense, um, as you move to less and less overlapped orbits until you reach a point where the instability time is so long um, that effectively it doesn't happen on an interesting time scale. So to summarize then, um, we had posed the question motivated by Kepler-36 of how compact you'd have two planets be while remaining long-lived. Um, and for initially circular orbits, we derived this criterion, where the critical separation depends only on the total mass of the planets to the 2 seventh power. Um, I hope I have also convinced you that this idea of resonance overlap um, is really a great way of understanding stability of these systems, because um, it, it explains essentially all of the structure and phase space in a way that the Hill criterion just does not. Um, and furthermore, if you're interested in extending this kind of work uh, to systems with more than two planets, which is something that I am interested in doing, um, the Hill criterion no longer applies, um, but the resonance overlap criterion would apply e uh, equally well. How, how this goes into the Hill criterion? <coughs> the Hill criterion, how does it transmute into the Hill criterion and the Hill But Like, where would it be on this plot? No, no in terms of your, your, your formula. Oh, so for the Hill criterion for initially circular orbits, um, I forget what the pre-factor is, but the scaling is um, the mass of the planets to the one-third power. So there should be, you should be able to take some limit of this, which gives you the criterion of the thing? Um, no, that's actually, it's a good question, but I think at this stage it's not clear how resonance overlap and the criterion that you develop in that way corresponds to the Hill boundary. So they're derived in completely different ways. Um, and I think that's, that's a really good question. That, I don't know the answer to. So, so the Hill criterion is, is, is it based only on, on, on the uh, you know resonance time instability or also K chaotic? Uh, so the Hill criterion is just um, it's basically based on in some sense that, so there's invariant curves in the phase space that correspond to um, conserving energy and angular momentum and if you project those down onto the the um, <coughs> sort of the physical space of the planets. Uh, you can say that there's going to be a region where the planets can't, their orbits can't go because of these invariant curves. Yeah, so it's just... It's just sufficient, as you said. Yeah. 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 Um, so in the future, uh, I'm interested now in trying to see, uh, so I'm, I said this at the beginning, but basically looking at the Kepler systems and trying to understand whether or not the lack of very compact pairs might be related to instability. Um, and the reason why this is interesting is because the Kepler planets are so deep in the potential of their, their host stars that basically they can't excite, even if they're very unstable and they pass very, very close to each other, they can't excite enough velocities to eject each other from the system. Um, and so what you end up with if a Kepler system exhibits instability is collisions between planets um, or collisions with the star. And so that means that if a Kepler system undergoes instability, we'd still be observing it today, we'd just be seeing it in a slightly different state. Um, so if we look at the Kepler data, um, we see this whole population of very flat, multi-transiting systems. And we know they have to be flat because if they had large mutual inclinations, we wouldn't be statistically likely to see all the planets transit. Um, but so have there been systems where using other kinds of work, like Doppler work, where they saw actually other planets that were not in the same plane? Uh, detected, but so, because with Doppler, you just get 
you don't learn actually the inclination because you just learn about the line of sight velocity and that could be so you could produce the same line of sight velocity with a more massive planet or with a more edge-on system. So you learn about the mass times sign of inclination. Um, so with transit timing variations, you could, um, yeah, so I think that's a, it's still sort of open though if there are mutually inclined systems. Um, but if you did have a flat system and it underwent instability, you might think that it would form a system like this. So it would excite mutual inclinations or it would increase the spacing between planets so that when you observed it, you would see a population of flat multi-transiting systems and then also these single transiting systems. Um, and it's been found that some of the single transiting systems do have statistically significant different properties compared to the multi-transiting systems. Um, so what I'm interested in doing is basically studying instability in these systems and trying to figure out what are the observable outcomes of stability to then compare with the Kepler data and also future data um, coming from TESS and the associated radio velocity for that. So in that case, for if TESS sees a single transiting system, but then RV follow-up says, oh, there's another planet in the system that's not transiting, then I think you might be able to say something um, interesting. Um, and then also K2 and Plato, which is a future mission. So K2 is the Kepler mission which failed, but it's been repurposed to um, study systems along the ecliptic, uh, or stars along the ecliptic. And then Plato, which is going to cover a large field of view, um, these are going to be targeting different stellar populations. And in particular, they'll be targeting, for some uh, areas of the sky, younger stars. So you can start to then see if there's um, observable properties of the planetary systems that are a function of the star's age. And that can also be used as a way to test whether that <coughs> instability is important. <coughs> and then I'd also, as I mentioned before, like to extend the theoretical work to try and understand more complicated, more realistic uh, planetary systems. Is the EA a large end limit of this problem? I mean, if you're, if they yeah. have like, like there's some statistical pro universal features in that sort of system that you can try mm -hmm. to approach as you yeah, so maybe I would think that I have like the hypothesis I would have is that going from three planets to ten planets doesn't change as much as going from two to three, something like that. Um, so the instability that occurs in these higher multiplicity systems is basically going to be associated with three bodies. Um, and then as you go to very, very large n, there's also some transition. Um, yeah. Okay, so now um, in the second part of my talk, I'll be describing uh, a little bit about how a different process, which is how planets interact with protoplanetary disks. So um, the basic, the very sort of simple picture is that um, a planet, as it moves through a disk uh, of gas, is sort of like a boat moving through a fluid, and it excites a, a wave around it. Except for, for the planet, the material that's inside, the planet is moving faster than the planet, and the material that's exterior is moving more slowly. And so this wave that the planet excites ends up getting sheared out into a spiral density uh, arm. And these uh, arms basically represent over density of material and there's a gravitational torque on the planet. Um, and that leads uh, both to eccentricity damping um, and also to net migration um, towards the host star, um, at least for low mass planets that don't significantly affect the structure of the disk. Um, and the simplest way to, to describe this um, the result of these interactions is just to say that they occur on a very, very long time scale compared to orbital time scales, um, so, and they exponentially damp some major axis and eccentricity, um, where these taus then are extremely long compared to orbital time scales. Um, and so that's sort of the simple picture that people have adopted. Um, the reason why we care about migration of these planets is because, well, we think there's, some, uh, there's been some observational evidence that it's been important for uh, real systems. So for example, migration within, uh, um, due to tidal uh, effects of the moons around Jupiter uh, is thought to produce the, the, some of the observed features that we see for that system. Uh, migration was also invoked to explain the population of hot Jupiters, and we don't think that works for all of them, but it might still explain why some of these hot Jupiters are so close to their host stars. And for these small planets, the interesting question is basically, how did we get so much mass in planets so close to the host star? If you look at a system like Kepler-11, there's uh, 22 Earth masses of the material within only a quarter of an AU. And in the solar system, there's only two Earth masses of the material in planets, which is in a distance six times that big. And so the question is, did these planets uh, form further out in the disk and then migrate to where we see them, or did they form more or less where we see them today, but out of a much more massive disk than we think existed for the solar system? Um, there's an interesting way to test this hypothesis, and that's by looking at the population of multi-planet systems. Because 
Um, if you have two planets in a disk and they're both uh, undergoing migration through interactions with the disk, um, and the migration is convergent, so the planets are slowly getting close to each other, what's going to happen is that they're going to pass over resonances. Um, and they're going to pass over resonances slowly. And the prediction is that if you pass over resonances slowly enough, you'll be captured into resonance. And so this is what this simulation is shown here um, from Lee and Peel in 2002. Um, the outer planet in this case is migrating inwards. At this point, it reaches the two to one resonance with the inner planet, and then they get captured into resonance and then they migrate together. Um, the capture into resonance, that process excites eccentricities, um, but the disk is also damping eccentricities. And so there's this equilibrium value here that they settle on. And this idea that planets that are convergently migrating get captured into resonances uh, also holds up because we think that, you know, we do see gas giants that are found in or near resonances. So, um, and again, this is that classic picture based on this very simple prescription. But when we look at the Kepler data, um, this period ratio distribution, you'll notice that although there are features near resonances, uh, by far most of the planets are not near resonant values. Um, so this lack of resonant features has been, uh, it's been suggested then that this is evidence that the planets couldn't have migrated. So the question that Constantine Batikin and I asked was essentially, how good is this classical picture? Um, is capture into resonance always permanent, as this simulation shows, or can it be temporary, or does it always have to happen? Um, mathematically, the question we were asking is, when is that fixed point at the center of resonance a stable fixed point, and when, of it, when is it going to be an unstable fixed point? So uh, the problem that we set up then was we had a conservative dynamics of two planets near resonance. That's just that pendulum analogy, that, that simple toy, not toy model, but that simple model that I uh, described to you earlier. There's also a, a prescription for how the interactions with the disks change semi-major semi axis and eccentricity. And so we adopted uh, a prescription that looks like this. So you still have exponential damping of eccentricities. There's this piece that would lead to exponential damping of semi-major axes, but then there's this coupling term. Um, this coupling term is actually important because although this time scale, the time scale for eccentricity damping is short for, for low mass planets compared to the semi-major axis migration time, um, the eccentricities are also small. Um, so this second term can be actually large or comparable to this first term. What, what is P? P is just a coupling parameter um, that's of order unity. So if P is equal to 1, then these two terms correspond to um, con um, basically eccentricity damping at constant angular momentum. Um, so in adopting this prescription, I want to just point out, so we were very in inspired by the, basically this was the same prescription adopted by Peter Goldreich and Hilke Schlichting in their work, uh, which focused on the circular restricted three-body problem. Um, and also this prescription agrees with hydrodynamic simulations of low mass <coughs> and, and isothermal disks. Um, for low enough eccentricities. So when you say that the coupling term, sorry, what, what do you couple? What do you couple? So the coupling is now, it's basically saying that the eccentricity evolution also affects the same major axis. They're not just totally independent. Yeah. Um, is there so, an easy way to yeah. see why the eccentricity enters squared? Um, why it's e squared. Um, so one way, so if p equals 1, then these two terms conserving the momentum. And maybe one way you could think about that is that the spiral arms that the planet excites, they come in inner and outer pairs, and the torque that they exert is almost equal and opposite. So, yeah, that's one, yeah, but. Okay, so um, in our analysis then, um, as I mentioned, we want to study basically the stability of this fixed point uh, within the context of this problem. So there are three dynamic degrees of freedom in this problem. There's the period ratio of the planets, the resonant angle, and also um, one eccentricity that takes into account both the eccentricity of the planets. So we solve for the fixed point, that's where all the time derivatives are zero, and then we just perform a simple linear stability analysis. Um, because there's three degrees of freedom, there's three eigenvalues. Um, there's a real one, and then there's a complex conjugate pair. And so for example, the, uh, a small perturbation to this eccentricity is gonna take a form something like this. Um, where there is an exponential decaying part because this eigenvalue is real and always negative. There's the imaginary part, which leads to an oscillatory uh, behavior. And then, be, depending on the sign of this one, of alpha 1, um, which is the real part, you either get an exponentially growing amplitude or decaying amplitude. So in the case where the fixed point is stable, you get permanent capture into resonance, and that's when this real part, alpha 1, is negative. 
So this is just the cartoon. This would be like if these are the different eigen directions. Um, so this is the plane of the, the complex conjugate pair, and then the alpha zero, you'd end up with something that looks like this, where you have a, a stable spiral in towards the fixed point. And that, uh, in some sense, is what was seen before by Lee and Peel, um, where you get captured to the fixed point and you just stay there. Um, in the opposite case, though, where you have a real uh, part for that complex conjugate pair, a positive real part, um, then you have an unstable spiral. And so on that same sort of cartoon video, um, you'd end up with motion that looks like this, where now the spiral has an exponentially growing amplitude. And when we ran simulations, numerical simulations, that's exactly what we saw. So here now you have a case where you have a small, a, a test particle essentially, migrating outward towards a massive planet. They're captured in the two to one resonance here, and then they break out, and then they keep getting closer together. And then they get captured in the three to two resonance, they stay in it for a while, and then they break out. <coughs> and in the eccentricity evolution in particular, you can see that they, the eccentricity grows up to an equilibrium value, and the dash line is what we predicted analytically. Um, and then there's this growing amplitude of oscillations about it until it breaks out. And so that's what we're seeing in the simulations as well. Uh, this is potentially very exciting, because it means that capture into resonance is not always permanent. And if you can escape from resonance, then maybe uh, this is some way to um, sort of, you know, explain the period ratio distribution, this lack of pairs of resonance, lack of planet pairs in resonance, but within the context of migration. Um, however, what we found is that capture is always permanent, so you would get a, a distribution peak near resonances. In the period ratio distribution, if the, same, if the eccentricity damping timescales of the two planets satisfies this criterion, where these are the two masses of the planets. Now, the timescale for interactions with disks um, scale inversely with the planet mass. And so if you plug that into this, this would imply that the resonance is stable if the outer planet is less massive than the inner planet. Um, so fundamentally, that means you can't use a restricted three-body analysis because you do, in this case, have this very critical mass ratio dependence. And this is unlike what we saw before for the case of two planets near resonance and just trying to understand their stability. <coughs> I'm surprised that there's not more um, effect from the fact that, you know, the, the properties of the disk. So, the, so far, the disk yeah. is like, well, so the disk, about what the mass is. Yeah. It's all buried in these. Okay. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. in, so I guess what we know is that the, the ratio of the two time scales of tau e to tau a, for small planets, that's something like 1 over 100. And it's related to the scale height of the disk. Mm -hmm. um, but the actual time scales depend on where the planets are and the density of the disk and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. But analytically, it almost doesn't matter as long as we assume that these time scales are long compared to the uh, interaction time scales of the planets with each other. Because mm -hmm. then it's always a slow evolution mm -hmm. on top of the internal dynamics. Um, another one of our results was that the pairs actually spend more time escaping resonance. Uh, when they can escape, then migrating between them. So this is now, these are comparable mass planets, so you can get that, and the outer planet's um, less massive, more massive, so you can get the, <coughs> the instability to happen. And what you see is that they break out of resonances, these res and resonances are these horizontal lines on this period plot, um, but uh, they by and large spend most of their time in a resonance of some kind. And so what that means is that if at some point you have a population of planets undergoing this behavior and the disk dissipates, um, you'd still be left with a population that's preferentially near resonances and not in between them. So uh, to summarize then, what we found is that either capture is permanent, and that depends on the mass ratio between the planets, uh, or capture is not permanent, but you're still left with a population that's near resonance. Um, and so in either case, migration is going to predict a population that's peak near resonances. But if you have some small perturbation on top of that from something else, yeah, the so one would be very um, stable, I would suppose, so. Yeah, I guess. It depends on the strength of the perturbation, of course, but you know, let's say you have a realistic system, or somewhat realistic system, yeah. in terms of two, you have a third one nearby. Yeah. Are, are there criteria which. Um, I don't know of analytic criteria. Yeah. But, but you could do probably perturbative. <coughs> uh, yeah, so you could ask, like, so you want to know if this pair is still spending time in resonance, but then there's another perturbation on top of it. That, that's right. Yeah. There is some small, small perturbation, I know. Yeah, so maybe uh, if you're left with a, like a pair that's in resonance, but then there's a Jovian planet further yeah. out, perturbations from that could knock it. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it's still something to look into. People have also talked about if the disk is strongly turbulent, that that can give sort of random kicks to the planets and then also knock them out of resonance. 
Um, but yeah. Um, so just as an aside, this idea of um, slow resonance crossings. Um, so this, in this case, it was two planets evolving slowly and crossing mean motion resonances. But this basic formalism uh, is almost the same that you need to understand uh, other physical problems with slow resonance crossing. So for example, a, a star in spiraling towards a very massive black hole, its orbital period is changing. Um, and so it can cross resonances with the precession frequency or with the nodal frequency. And uh, I don't know, possibly get captured into resonance uh, in that case as well. Um, so for Kepler though, I think the conclusion, um, at least sort of the simple conclusion to draw from this is that this lack of period ratios near mean motion resonances um, does suggest that in-situ formation is maybe a more likely candidate to explain their, their presence. Um, so there's still open questions that are remaining. Um, I don't know if that's a little hard to read, but um, there's also potentially problems with in-situ formation as well. So for example, if the, you have planets, you have very, very small bodies um, colliding with each other and accreting to form bigger and bigger bodies very close to their host stars, um, their relative velocities, just because their Keplerian velocities are large, are also going to be very large. And so it's an interesting question to figure out at one point, are those velocities big enough that you actually get fragmentation instead of uh, sort of accretion between small bodies? Um, another question that I spoke about earlier was trying to understand still if instability has been important in the evolution of these systems. Um, as I'll say in just a second, um, we think that instability is important in our own solar system and also for gas giants. And so. It, it is really an interesting question to see if it's also important for these low mass systems. <coughs> but I think the big question sort of hanging over all of this is trying to determine, you know, we know these systems of low mass planets or being close to their host star are extremely common. And so the question then is, is the solar system somehow distinct because it doesn't have one, or is it just on the edge of the distribution that we haven't quite probed yet with our observational techniques? If it is different, we need to understand why. And so I think actually from W first, um, there's going to be a lot of very interesting results coming in, a lot of interesting observational evidence that will help us um, understand this question and be able to answer it. In red, this is the location of the Kepler survey, where it was observation sensitive. And blue here, this is on a panel of planet mass and semi axis. Um, and in blue is where W first is, should be able to find planets. Um, and so you can see that it's getting to a region where there's solar system planets and small planets like those discovered by Kepler. And so I think W first has the potential then to put our solar system into a greater context. So just for context, yeah. um, can you remind us what TESS is supposed to find planets? Is yeah. that a bit closer? Yeah, so TESS, the big goal with TESS is to find small planets around bright stars. And because if they were bright stars, you can use radio velocity follow-up. So then you'll get radiuses and masses. Whereas for Kepler, um, a lot of the stars are too faint for radio velocity follow-up. Um, so that would be kind of in the lower left? Yeah, but TESS is, um, so TESS at the poles, it'll get uh, half year coverage, mm -hmm. but its fields of view it is only covering for 30 days. So it's finding really, really short period planets. Yeah. Um, and atmospheric characterization is the other mm -hmm. thing for TESS. Yeah. Um, okay, so just to really quickly wrap up, um, so I've been talking about physical processes are important for shaping planet orbits. And trying to motivate this by saying that by understanding these processes, we can understand the diversity of planets that we've seen. And so the two processes that I spoke about today were interaction with the disk and also instability of planetary systems. And so I've been talking about them in the context of these small, low mass systems. Um, but they're also thought to be important in the evolution of these Jupiter analogs, so these exo gas giants. Um, as I showed at the beginning, um, these gas giants have a very uh, hot uh, eccentricity distribution. Um, and this eccentricity distribution is consistent with the outcome of planet-planet scattering. So you start with a system of Jovians that is unstable, and you let them evolve, and they'll reproduce this eccentricity distribution. The flaw in this is that these simulations all assume instability to start with. So in this paper, they start with 10 to 50 Jupiter planets, <laughs> mass planets, on very, very compact orbits. And so, of course, they're unstable, and then they show they produce the right distribution. But the question is, what actually sets up the instability in the first place? Um, as I've just stated, we think that planets that interact with a disk um, that undergo converged migration are trapped into mean motion resonances. And indeed, something like 20% of the gas giants that we've seen are near mean motion resonances. <coughs> um, however, it's also been demonstrated that these resonances are actually quite stable once the disk goes away. And so it's extremely unclear at this point how you link the outcome of interaction with the protoplanetary disk um, with the instability that's needed to explain the eccentricity distribution. And so this is the question that I, I'm very interested in thinking about in the near future. 
Um, to aid us in answering it, uh, Gaia is going to provide a lot of uh, a lot of great data. Um, so Gaia is detecting planets using astrometry. Um, so it's basically just tracking the motion of stars on the sky, and that motion is a combination of the proper motion of the star as well as, and the parallactic motion of the star, as well as small perturbations to that caused by the motion of the star about the very center of the planetary system. Um, and so what Gaia is going to tell us is basically the positions and velocities of all of these planets and their masses. And that's exactly what you need to study the dynamics of these systems. And so from that, I think we're going to get a better estimate of the fraction of these gas giant systems that are in a resonance. We'll get a better idea of their eccentricities and mutual inclinations um, and so on. Um, just as an aside, I think that some of these systems are not going to be very well characterized from the Gaia data alone. And so combining the Gaia data with also the requirement of long-term stability uh, could refine system parameters for some of them. And so that's that also motivates thinking about stability of these high mass <coughs> as well. Um, on the other side of things, uh, with direct imaging, um, and also ALMA, we're going to be imaging systems that are very, very young. Um, so systems like HR8799, which through direct imaging, you have to, um, you only see the luminosity from planets when they're very young and they haven't cooled off yet. So these are young systems. Um, and then, of course, with ALMA and um, looking at emission from disks, so that's also probing the systems when they're very young. And so, sort of with this, these other observational techniques, we're also going to be probing um, this question from a different angle of trying to understand how these systems evolved. Um, and ultimately, this is really important because these processes of instability and migration, capture into resonance, are thought to happen in a, that thought to have happened in our own solar system's history. So Jupiter and Saturn convergently migrated, were trapped into resonance, um, subsequently broke out of resonance, and there was a small scale instability in our own solar system where it's thought that that has happened. And so by looking at these exoplanetary systems and actually testing whether or not these same processes happened is incredibly important for putting our solar system in context. So I think that the future for exoplanets and uh, their dynamics is still extremely bright. And finally, I just want to say, uh, I think that the future for dynamics in general is very bright. Not just for exoplanets, which I hope I've convinced you is going to be important for you know, decades to come, um, but also with Gaia, we're going to learn about the positions and velocities of stars in our galaxy and there's all the galactic dynamics that comes um, with that. Um, there's also the interesting dynamics of compact objects, um, which I think will also be extremely exciting in the near future um, with the uh, uh, recent discovery from LIGO and um, apparently many more to come. So with that, I'll say thank you for your attention. Uh. In turn, so, so you're talking about this migration in the context of the small planets in the disk. Yeah. The hot Jupiter, like, the hot Jupiters, there, there was this idea, which I think you were alluding to it when you were talking about the eccentricity distribution, which is like the Kozai mechanism where you have some third yeah. body that, that it, that's bringing them in. And what's, what's, a, like, what's the status of that, and why doesn't that... Why, why isn't that a possible way to get these smaller planets to, to also migrate? So the problem with COSI for small planets um, is that the COSI, that process, basically you start with an extremely eccentric orbit, uh -huh. um, and then there, well, or, and the perturber is inclined, and then you get these trade-offs between um, inclination and eccentricity of the planetary orbit, and that's what the COSI cycles are. So you go from an extremely eccentric one to something that's circular and then inclined, and that goes on. And then when the planet's very eccentric and it passes near pericenter, there's this tidal interaction between the planet and the star, and then that slowly circularizes the planet and brings it in. Okay. So that's how it's supposed to work for hot Jupiters in that context. But um, I don't think it would work for these systems because you have these multi-planet systems. And so I don't see how you can really get them all the COSI together. Because they would all be on extremely eccentric orbits. I see. Orbits, I see. So just the fact that there are multiple planets within yeah. this very small radius. Yeah, and that they look dynamically okay. quiet as well. Yeah. But is that still like a viable idea for the hot Jupiters? I haven't fall, I just haven't yeah. followed it. I, don't know. I think. Um, yeah, for sure, it's definitely still viable. Just planet planet scattering is also uh, another explanation. Um, people now are starting to talk about in situ formation of hot Jupiters, um, which you know a few years ago was totally no one ever believed. So I think the hot Jupiter is, I don't know, I don't think it's clear yet at all which is the dominant process for making them. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
So you mentioned um, very nicely you know, the Kepler data and the kind of constraints it had and observations, and then some of your work to explain it. Do you have, perhaps I missed it, um, <coughs> do you have any predictions? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Any, no, so that's just a, ca a case, you know, what you predict for test to see. Yeah. Um, um, anything, things. So that's sort of the next, that I haven't done it yet, but that's something mm -hmm. I want to work on is to, you know, to study the instability in these systems and then figure out what the range of mutual inclinations are. So. Yeah, and the eccentricities and that sort of thing to actually say predict how many of these single transiting systems should have perturbers um, and what their period ratio should be. So the goal is to make uh, predictions for something like this. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? What is the present situation? Is the solar system particular peculiar or not very special? Um, so, I think that the solar system, I don't think we know if it's peculiar yet, but we might be able to say it's not the most common outcome of planet formation. Um, it's not the most common. Yeah, although, so, this, um, <coughs> so there's this Kepler, this, these are the, the Kepler planets, um, and we actually, so from this data we can say that small planets with very short orbital periods are very common, and the solar system doesn't have those. But to me, it's sort of unclear whether or not this distribution is just going to sort of extend out further, and then maybe the solar system is going to then appear like it fits in. Um, does that answer your question? So, so, so many systems have smaller planets nearby, so in yeah. and ours, that's And we don't. Point. But that population, if we observed, say if Kepler observed longer, maybe it would have found that small planets at 1 AU are also extremely common. Um, and then in that context, then our solar system wouldn't seem strange. But if this, there's some hints that the distribution is dropping off for longer periods, um, and then, then our solar system looks maybe more like an oddball, if that's the case. Yeah. In some sense, even having Jupiter already puts us in a group of stars of only 10% of stars that has this Jupiter analog. So. Yeah. Jupiter analog. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>